Hi, this is Daniel with Unrivaled Investing, and today we're going to talk about Snowflake. The company is growing over 100%, and investors are wondering, should they get in on it? Should they buy Snowflake at the IPO? And what type of, of returns should they expect in the future? So why did Snowflake get my interest? First of all, I already mentioned the IPO aspect of it. So it's a new and exciting company. It's fast growing, growing well over 100%. And also Berkshire Hathaway, which has traditionally been associated with value investing, buying companies on the cheap. This is They're making new territory with investing at the IPO. So this is super interesting to watch. I will dig into each of these components in this video. So let's, let's see, what are we actually gonna talk about? First, what is Snowflake? What do they do if this is your first time hearing about it? This starts to get you up to speed on their business and how do they make money? What's their value proposition? Is it unrivaled? How do they generate sales? Uh, and then the last component, I have a free investment calculator. It's in the bottom of this video, at the end of this video, um, it's the bottom of the, the description where you can click on it and you can play around with your own risk reward assumptions about what you think Snowflake stock will do in the future. You know, does this have 10x potential, you know, potential to make 10 times your money over time. Um, but before digging in, if you're interested in talking about potential multi baggers, companies that can go up hundreds or even thousands of percent over time, click that subscribe button. If you're already a subscriber, hit that like button. And if you want to know what I'm personally buying in any given month, what I'm buying, what I'm selling, what I hold, why, go to unrivaledinvesting.com, click on that journey button, and that's where you can see it. Also, if you have a question um, or you, you, there's a company that you want me to look at, feel free to leave a note you know, below this video and I'll, I'll respond to you. So what is Snowflake? Ticker is S-N-O-W. Snow is a cloud data platform specifically designed, built from the bottom up to leverage the public cloud platforms. And you can see this is a little slide from the presentation where you know Snowflake helps with data engineering, data warehouse, data science, data applications, data exchange, all built as a layer effectively on top of the three public cloud platforms, which is Google Cloud, AWS, which is Amazon's cloud offering, and Azure, which is Microsoft. So, you know, like when, when you see this, you should automatically be thinking, okay, so this is helping them, helping companies store their data, process their data, retrieve their data, analyze their data, um, transfer their data around, make sure the people that need to have their data, you know, get it. You know, how do they, how do they run queries and access data in a timely and efficient and cost, cost efficient way? You know, there's all sorts of aspects. You know, how do you make sure you're sharing data with maybe counterparties that, that you want to have limited access to? How do you make sure your data is governed correctly? Because, you know, some companies have more restrictions on how they're data is managed. You know, a bank is going to have very different, you know, government's rules than let's say a pot retailer. You know, you can have a whole range of, of government complications. Data is a very broad term, but you can see that it touches a lot of things. And also data is the lifeblood for a lot of businesses. And they are touching these three pillars of growth, um, which is these three public providers, Google Cloud, AWS, and Azure. Now let's take a step back. You know, for those that this is the first time they're, where they're they're thinking like, hey, what's what's a cloud provider? What's the appeal of the cloud? Sort of high level. You know, the appeal of the cloud is businesses are creating more and creating and using more data than ever. And in the past, you know, companies not that long ago, companies would store their data on premise, but this could be prohibitively expensive. You might see like, well, wait a second, Daniel's talking about Snowflake. Why is there a picture of Mark Zuckerberg here? You know, why, why the picture of Zuck? Um, and, you know, what's super interesting is the first investment that Facebook took was from was from Peter Thiel, and it was summer of 2004. And the, Peter Thiel made an angel investment of a half a million dollars for 10% of the company. In the primary, you know, usage of those funds, which wasn't, you know, that's this this isn't game changing. He's like five hundred thousand dollars. You're not not talking, not talking millions upon millions of dollars. Five hundred thousand dollars. He was primarily used for servers, and that's because historically, 
companies needed their, to buy servers that they would manage themselves to host all the data, to run all the processing. Like if you wanted a website like Facebook, you had to buy your own servers and do all this stuff. You know, and it would be prohibitively expensive to be able to grow so quickly you know, because now you're just making, as you grow, you're going to need all these servers. You're going to need someone that's going to oversee them, make sure there's infrastructure that's, you know, everything's safe and sound. Um, and what's amazing is AWS, so that was the first of the major cloud, you know, public cloud providers, was founded in 2006. You know, this this investment was in 2004. So just imagine how much rich, richer Zuck would be if he was able to have used, you know, AWS or a public public cloud provider um, like Google or Azure. It, it doesn't have to be AWS. That's the point. You know, and, and currently Facebook is worth hundreds of billions of dollars. That stake, that 10% stake would have been worth, you know, easily $50 billion at this point um, just had that public cloud option been been available. That's, that's sort of mind blowing to me. Um, but now, you know, the, you have these public clouds, you have AWS, you have Azure, you have Google Cloud. And the revolution is that you pay for what you use. It's not that you pay for the server, um, that you you have to rent a rent an entire server. It's you're paying for the data storage, you're paying for the processing use. It's a this is a complete revolution in data usage. And this has been going on for some time. Um, you know, for the last at least the last decade plus. Salesforce.com, that's sort of what their business model was driven off of. Um, and they're dramatically lowering the cost for startups. And, and also, so it's not only lowering the cost for startups to do business, but it's also lowering the cost of maintenance for businesses because they no longer have to hire, you know, as many folks just to maintain those servers, just to maintain their data because they can hire engineers that work with using AWS or one of these public cloud solutions. And so this, this dramatically lowers the cost for companies for their data usages. Um, but on the flip side, so, so the companies can grow faster and you can have, you know, startups that grow faster and businesses can be more efficient, but big, but is that there is some concentration risks. Like you effectively are marrying one of these public clouds where you're saying like, Hey, I, this, this cloud company, if, if I'm going to do business with them, they're going to see everything I do. Like I'm marrying them. They can see everything. And you could, you can imagine the conflict there. Like for a while it was just AD, AWS out there. So if you are a major retailer, do you really want to put your e-commerce business, your, you know, omni-channel business on Amazon's cloud where they could see it or where they're effectively their their retail ops are competing with you. You know, does that does that make sense? Um, this is a really tough dynamic where you have three players and you kind of have to marry them. Like if if you're gonna be going to business, you know, if if you want if you want to trust your data with them, um, it's it's sort of like marriage. And so the question is, well, is it? Um, what if you could find a solution where you could actually leverage all three. And that's that's sort of what Snowflake's value proposition. That's one of their value propositions because a lot of it is is what they're what they're offering, you know, being aligning with the cloud, you know, and, and cloud's adoption. But one aspect of Snowflake's value proposition is as a da data cloud pl platform, they are agnostic um, to which cloud you choose and they even enable multi-cloud architecture. So you know, if you're you're excited about you know your Latin American ops and you want to use AWS for Latin America and you want to use Azure for the U.S. and you want to use Google Cloud for Eastern Europe or whatever, you know you can you can do that. You don't have to marry any given choice. You can you know polymorphous. Um, and as as they say in their filing, you know, optimize for the best features and functionality of each public cloud providers without becoming overly reliant on a single cloud provider. Optimize, optimize their cloud costs, seamlessly migrate data among public clouds. So this is really important. You could send data, one cloud to the other if you need to. You could send like, hey, this is where we're going to be using it. And let's say, you know, AWS, they've built out more data centers in Latin America and their service is faster, runs better in Latin America than Azure. So then you could say, oh, okay, I'm going to go with AWS, but I really like the deal that I'm able to get over here in you know eastern europe so i'm going to stick with gcp over there so you can see you know you can leverage the three 
to get the best deal for yourself. It's no longer that you're, oh my goodness, I'm married to this person. Like this is going to be a really tough position to be in. Like now it's like, hmm, what, what, what can I get? Um, this is not marriage. This could be a polymorphous relationship. This is exciting stuff for some people. Um, so also, you know, if you look, look at Snowflake's ecosystem, I'm going to be talking about data sharing. And if, if talking about data sharing and how that can be a, a helpful value proposition is boring to you, I have this cute puppy picture, picture of puppies for you to look at, but I'm going to talk about their, their, why, why value sharing and sharing is caring and it's important. So here it is from their filing. Um, you know, they say the ben business benefits from powerful network effects, which create accelerating demand for our platform and provide us with competitive advantages. The data cloud will continue to grow as organizations move their silo data from cloud-based repositories and on-premise data centers to the data cloud. The more customers adopt our platform, the more they can share data with or receive data from this is critical, other Snowflake customers. So they're saying the more people that adopt their platform, the easier it's going to be to share data, private data from one company to another, partners, data providers, enhancing the value of the insights delivered by our platform for all users. This is potentially revolutionary stuff here. Um, they, they provide an example in the next paragraph where they talk about Star Schema, a data provider of, to leading organizations, made its COVID-19 data available on our data marketplace in March 2020. As of July 31st, 2020, hundreds of Snowflake customers have consumed this data directly from their accounts to analyze the impact of the outbreak. This is incredible. So if you have one company that has relevant data, and, and let's say it's, it, it's a like a nonprofit just looking to do good and share information like hey here's here's a pandemic we 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 want to share our stats with you they can share that make that easily available and link that directly up with other customers using snowflake database that's why this is revolutionary um our platform allows our customers to unify third party data sets with their internal data to analyze and measure the impact of COVID-19 on their business operations, sales, and supply chains to make data-driven decisions in near real time. In addition, customers are able to augment their analysis with other third-party data. For example, customers can use data from WeatherSource, another data provider on our marketplace, to correlate the relationships between disease infection rates and the weather. I mean, there have been all these times on past calls that I've listened to where, you know, retail companies are like, yeah, the weather had a bit of an impact on our quarter. Now, if you're, if you're a company with your data on Snowflake, you can directly see that weather impact on a very, like on a time frame basis. Like, oh yeah, it started raining here and this is when it stopped raining because that's the data we got from here, this other Snowflake customer, we're directly pulling that into our internal private data to see like, oh yeah, sales did dip because people decided to stay at home. I mean, this COVID stuff, that's a whole other, you know, that's that's amazing to be able to say like, hey, we're looking at COVID and see if weather impacts this. And that's, that's probably gonna impact someone else's sales and maybe impact like what's gonna be available on the supply chain. Like maybe people aren't gonna be making as much meat like what we've seen um, with COVID. I mean, this is mind blowing that the more customers that join Snowflake, the it creates this ecosystem where companies can work together, share data, pick and choose what data you want to share. And that enhances your value proposition as a company, makes Snowflake, in my mind, untouchable. Um, so does Snowflake have an unrivaled value proposition? And keep in mind, I view all investments through the lens of value proposition. If you have an unrivaled value proposition, that automatically means you're probably in the top 5% of all companies. Most companies face brutal, rivaled warfare day after day. They're just <laughs> competing head on, and it is tough. But when you're unrivaled, it means you offer a good or a service that you simply can't get elsewhere. And when you can't get that service elsewhere, you keep going back to that same company. And that's what's driving long-term returns. And that's what drives the best shareholder returns over time. Because consistency of growth is what drives long-term returns. And so does Snowflake 
have an unrivaled value proposition? Does it have this right to win, to continue growing in the years ahead? And I'm giving them the big thumbs up. Like the things I'm seeing about multi-cloud architecture and creating an ecosystem where they can share this data, this is incredible stuff. They are, they are touching the lifeblood of companies, which is data, so that way companies can make better decisions, can see you know historical truth of what their business has been. This is, this is incredibly important stuff, and we will go more into their financials in just a minute. But you can see you know, what companies are currently using them. Many of the Fortune 500 is currently using Snowflake. You can see Adobe, Capital One, Instacart, DocuSign, Sony, Overstock. I just did a video about Overstock, and for those that are interested in about Overstock's not just a retail company, but it's a that's what I originally thought it was, but it's an e-commerce company that's also trying to make a bet on blockchain. So if you're interested in that, you can check that out. So this is just incredible to see like what they're doing and who they're who's who's aligning with them, who's becoming customers. So how do they make money? Like I've 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 sort of provided a high level overview of Snowflake, but how do they actually make their their money? How do they, you know, generate revenue? Where's the where's the cash? Show me the cash. Um and the Snowflake business model is to based on primarily capacity arrangements where they charge based on compute, so duration and volume of the data processed for their customer, the storage, so the average amount of terabytes stored per month. Um, and keep in mind, this is not on their you know, infrastructure. This is on the counterparty that they're using, the, the public cloud that they're using. So it's average amount of terabytes per month stored on AWS. So it's effectively like a markup that that Snowflake gets. And then there's also a data transfer of how many terabytes of data um, you know, are, are sent to where, to which provider, you know, AWS, Azure, which which public cloud and which locality, because this is this is also sort of getting into the nuances that if it's a location, if it's a region that has a bunch of different data centers, you know, it's probably going to be more competitive rates. But if, you know, Google is the only one operating in this region and therefore it's going to be the fastest and best compute, um, you know, your, your costs are going to be different. So that's this is how it's structured where you're you're paying based on how much you're expecting each month um, to use, you know, how much computing process are you going to be using? How much storage? And generally, you know, what's interesting, so you can see like the full capacity sign, but what about going over or under when you have capacity arrangements? Like, does that like shut down your business if you start going over capacity? Here's where it gets interesting. So if you go over capacity, then they say, you know what, we, we probably need to restructure our arrangement. You know, there are, there, are, there are parts in their contracts for overages. But then they say, look, if you're consistently going over, let's redo our, our you know, relationship, our contract, maybe move from a monthly to a quarterly or an annual, get a better discount. Um, and here's where the, the part that I really respected from reading from their, their filing is that if you're under capacity, they don't, it's not like, oh, you paid for it, it's gone. It rolls over to the next month. And so that that's automatically a huge goodwill gesture saying like, look, we bet that you're going to grow. We know that you intended to use this. We in, you intended to use this processing, this data storage. And and they they call out generally if it's one or the other customers are going over versus under. So it's it's a, you know, pay for what you eat business model. And if you go over, we'll figure it out. If you go under it's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll roll it over to next month. And this is part of the reason why I think they have an NPS score, which is a net promoter score of 70 plus. And this is critical to think about because when this is, this is a data company, like 70 is, is the type of score you'd expect from like an Apple or a Tesla, like brands that people love. When you have a net promoter score, it's a sign of like, are you willing to refer other customers to, to what to what you're currently using. And if it's a negative, it's like, no, I'm going to tell people to go away from this. But positive 70, like 70% of the time, people are like, oh yeah, we definitely recommend other users, other, other people looking for a data cloud solution to consider Snowflake. When you have a word of mouth army like that, that automatically increases the efficiency of your sales force, which is super important to think about. So, we understand how they generate revenue. What about their market opportunity? You know, there are 100% growth that we're currently seeing. You know, is this sustainable? And the answer is their opportunity is ginormous. Um, 
you know, like management calls out $80 billion plus opportunity versus their 500 million annualized revenue rate. Ginormous. Uh, I didn't think this was a real word. I was curious, but um, for Snowflake, it makes sense. You know, it's huge. Uh, what about their financials? Um, but, but, you know, I, I ask at the top, does this have the opportunity to 10X? Like, yeah, $80 billion versus 500 million in revenue. This business has the potential to 10X. So as a shareholder, like, unless the valuation comes down dramatically, you have the potential to ride long-term growth here. So what about their financials? Um, so broadly, their financials, like, aren't, great. Um, you know, their gross margins are in the 60s. Now, part of that is because it includes service revenue, but a large chunk of it is paying, you know, not only the cost of customer support, which is generally like 5, 10, 20 percent, um, but but you're seeing, you know, the, there's probably 20 percent of their cost, which is going to down to the public clouds. So that's the reason why their gross margins will never be the, what you would expect from a pure software play that can be 80, 90% plus gross margins. It's going to be restricted based on that factor. That's going to hold margins down. And so there, you know, there's a little, ooh, you know, op, that, that's the visual you see there. The, the operating losses have ranged from like 60 to 100% of revenue. So that's obviously not great. You know, like when you see a business that's, that's at that level of cash burn operating losses, that said, like, look, they're growing super fast. It makes sense for them to be investing in R and D, for them to invest in in land and expand, and you know, winning with new customers. So this this totally makes sense. Um, and I would expect that their margins would be structurally better um, in the future. Now it will be structurally lower than pure software companies, but they won't be. This this company can be profitable at scale. Like that's that strikes me as for certain. Um, yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's really the main point. Like, do they, what do their financials look like? Revenue is great. It's growing at 100%, but their operating margins aren't so hot. Um, do they have the balance sheet to handle this? And they have a hundred million, you know, about cash burn. And after the, the IPO, it's going to be over 3 billion. So they've got a nice fat, juicy wallet. They can, they can handle the burn. And honestly, it's, it's making the right investments in the company, you know, in terms of their growth. You know, if you're seeing over 100% growth, that's great. What about valuation? You know, so here's, here's where it's going to start getting tricky. You know, the valuation, you know, pricing range is supposedly somewhere between like 75 and, and 85 dollars a share i i'm penciling out 85 dollars i expect that once it goes public you know the the share price can be dramatically higher than that could be you know especially with the general stock market fervor that we've seen recently um but that pencils out around 24 billion dollar valuation um you know this this compares to 600 million dollars in in sales you know that you're looking at for for this this upcoming fiscal year or for this current fiscal year ending in january 2021 um and that 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 pencils out somewhere between 125 and 140 percent year over year growth which is great um and that's that's based on what what we've seen so far um now once again like on the margins perspective i'm not going to pencil out 30 40 percent operating margins because we know their gross margins are going to be inherently lower because they have to pay, you know, part of their cost is a, is a pass through of the public clouds. Um, and so their, their operating margins, you know, maybe I'm penciling out 15 to 20%. And you can see the implied earnings mul multiple would be super rich if you were using this optimized margin um, of like 200 to 300 times. So it's, it's not cheap, uh, especially you know, given that it's not software margins, but it is like, it still could be very good margins of 15 to 20%. This is theoretical. And, you know, it, it could be reasonable for a company that's expected to continue to grow in the future. It's not just about what's, what's a point in time. It's about what are you expected to deliver in the years, to deliver in the years ahead. And so I'm, I, I'm penciling that out in the investment period. Let's say you have five years and what's sort of the growth rate? And this is also sort of a question mark. Like on the low side, I'm saying they compound at 50% annualized. Now, first of all, that's exceptional. Not many businesses will come anywhere near that. That means in five years, you will grow over seven times. On the high side, 
And keep in mind, this is I'm doing a hypothetical range, is I'm saying 80% annualized. That means 19 times growth over the next five years. That might be crazy. I don't know. I'm putting a range of possibilities. Part of the reason why there's such a wide range is because they're tapping into this super fast growing market. I mean, if you see the growth rates at some of the public clouds, it's not that far from here. So they're they're tapping into it. And plus, their revenue isn't ginormous. It's not billions and billions of dollars yet. You know, you're talking about a couple hundred million dollars. So, you know, based on that range, you know, assuming I'm, I'm giving a pretty wide range in terms of multiples as well, you know, and, and honestly, a little higher than I'm normally comfortable with considering of like 30 to 50 times. Um, but that that gets an interesting range of like downside, downside of 30, 40 percent five years from now. So over five years, you've lost about 40% of your investment, but upside of nearly 300%. Um, that's not a terrible risk reward, you know, like about nine to one. Um, and so I can understand why Berkshire is going to, con you know, is going to invest at the IPO. I'll talk more about that in a second, but if you're interested in playing around with your own analysis or assumptions of what the hypothetical price can be, and keep in mind, that's exactly what this is. This is a hypothetical range. Of course, the stock price can go way above, you know, what, what I think it'll be five years from now. You know, it could go above that the first month. You know, things can go bananas. That's how the stock market works. And it can also go b way below. That's why it's a hypothetical range. I try to have some sort of logic, some rationality. And that's my value proposition to you, my loyal YouTube subscribers, because by now you've clicked that subscribe button, um, where you can go under the description of this video, I'm going to have a link where you can click on this and you can play around with this sheet yourself. You just download it and play around with it. So that way you can pencil out like, hey, I think this is the price where I can crush it in Snowflake stock because it has that value proposition that Daniel was talking about. It has a big market opportunity. I'm excited and I'm, I'm aligning with Berkshire. I'm, I'm aligning myself with Warren Buffett. Me and Warren Buffett go like this. So I'm going to do what he does. And the question is, is Warren Buffett actually doing this? Um, and first of all, no, there's no way Warren Buffett is the one that's making this investment. Like for all the numbskulls that think that Warren Buffett is, he's not. Like I'm, I'm gentleman's bet that he's not. He has two lieutenants, uh, Ted and Todd, that each manage several billion dollars in the Berkshire Hathaway portfolio. Their bet size is generally this size of a couple hundred million, maybe to a billion dollars. And this all in is going to be about a $600 million investment where they're doing a private placement of 250 and then they're doing another 300 million from an existing shareholder that they're buying from at the IPO price, which is interesting. And it's it's what's what's revolutionary about this is that it's amazing to see the evolution of Berkshire because just a few years ago, you know, Charlie Munger, who I respect immensely, he, you know, he helps run the business with Warren Buffett. You know, I, I respect him not only as an investor, but as an individual, you know, the character, um, it's just incredibly, incredibly admirable. Um, you know, they, they talk about how they're constantly trying to learn, even though they're in their nineties. And, you know, t it takes a lot of, takes a lot of willpower to say, Hey, I'm going to trust these other people to start these, these non-family, non-blood, to start making these investments in companies that they would traditionally never touch. And only a few years ago, they were talking about how they were doing thumb sucking on Google and how they, it was such a terrible loss that they, they missed it, that it was so obvious to them because Geico, one of the companies they, they, um, they own, was using Google for advertising. And it was just so obvious that they completely blew it even though there were plenty of times that it would have been, you know, would have fit perfectly with them. And obviously Google stock has done exceptionally well. And in full disclosure, I personally own shares in Google, but it's, it's really interesting to, to see like this evolution from, you know, like, Oh, it was never cheap enough. Google never came down to 10 times earnings or 15 times earnings to seeing a portion of the company willing to pay 40 times forward sales. This is a company that's burning cash at hundred million dollars plus a year, you know, but don't, don't get too excited 
about their purchase. Um, you know, the reality is it's it's a six hundred million dollar investment on four hundred billion dollars in equity. If it got wiped out, which I don't think it will, um, it's honestly meaningless relative to, to Berkshire's current value. But it's exciting to see the evolution and thinking that you're that you're looking at with Berkshire. If you're interested in seeing what I'm personally buying or selling or holding in any given month, and what are the top reasons, go to unrivaledinvesting.com, click on that journey button, and your patronage enables helps enable the production of these videos. So I hope you're enjoying these videos. If you enjoyed this video about Snowflake, hit that subscribe button or hit that like button. Thanks so much for watching.